Fantastic to see you here today. And do not think that we can't see you, we can see all of you. So welcome everyone. Welcome family. It is wonderful to see you gathered here today. To see you here is a sign of the state of our nation. It is a sign of the feeling that has arisen in our people. Some of you are here to listen and learn and others of you have come to gather together because you are concerned and you have seen an opportunity to do something about that feeling, to take action. I'm Tiamara Williams, your candidate for Banks Peninsula. Now is the time that we must all go beyond the usual choice of red and blue and green and black. Today is the time for us to come together as one people, one family, and take New Zealand back. Today, we are fighting for our freedom and our personal and national sovereignty. We live in a paradise called Aotearoa. We have grown in a land of freedom, a place where owning your home is normal, growing your food is common, thinking and speaking your truth freely and expectation. Right now, we are teetering on the edge of losing all of that for all time. We are in our darkest hour. Suddenly, police have been given the right to enter our homes without a warrant and force us into a government facility. Our Prime Minister believes that telling us she and her team are the single source of truth is acceptable. Online freedom has been whipped away without our consent. Our government has been rushing through bills. Our city plans come from the UN Agenda 2030 and are being implemented without us realising. Ask yourself, are you willing for that to be your legacy? This is the time to ask, what will I do about it? This moment has risen like a tsunami from the silent ones. We have heard you.
We have heard you in your silent concern, and together we have watched in amazement, disbelief, and increasing unease as our government and the ones before it have sold us out. They have served us up on a platter to a foreign dream of globalization. Others outside our country are calling the shots. We the people no longer control have control over our borders, our environment, our health choices, our freedom of speech and our freedom of being. The plan ahead is something we know only from the movies. But today it is real, no longer a conspiracy theory. And we say no. of darkness comes light. Out of wrong must come right. So let us all forget about politics this election and as one people, one family, save our nation and each other. Let us write a constitution that will protect our people and our freedom throughout time. Let's build our nation back from the devastation of massive COVID debt by mining the massive talent on our shores. Let's nurture and protect the natural treasure of our land and water and air. Let us stand strong together and take back our nation. And so it is my pleasure to introduce our party secretary, Bill Karatiana. He is behind the scenes lighting the way for this movement to come forth. So please welcome Bill. <laughs> What an outstanding candidate! <laughs> Behind me are our other candidates as well. They have taken up the challenge to take up the torch to take us all to the big house in Wellington. <laughs> it's great to see New Zealanders standing up for New Zealand. It is so good to see. And travelling around the country with our leader, Billy Takahika, it's been simply amazing. The passion, the truth, the salt of the earth people that come forward who are worried about the future for their children, who are worried about bearing arms, being treated as criminals, who are worried about getting a needle pointed into their bodies with no choice. These are real issues, real concerns, and are not conspiracies. It's been a privilege to be a part of that journey as the party secretary. So, what I want to impress on you today, today New Zealanders are making history for New Zealanders. Today is government for the people, by the people, and most importantly, in the interests of the people. Yeah. So against all the naysayers and all the political strategists and all of the commentators, all of the trolls, all of those negative people that thought they knew better, we now have a leader. We now have a party, and now we have a movement! And my role to this, uh, this afternoon is to introduce you to the leader of that movement, Mr. Billy Takahika!
Tuyo ki te whenua Tuyo ki te nakau na tangata katoa Ko te mea nui, ko te aroha a iu kraiti Ko te wehi ki te atoa me whakakurore a tono ingoa i ngā wā katoa Ki a tauma e te mana ki tanki ronga e te kingi a iu kraiti Pai mairere ki ia ia me tono whare me te kaupapo o tēnei wā E te mauri o te whenua tamiki makaurau nga mana a iwi tēnā koutou tēnā koutou tēnā nō tātou katoa. E nga whānau e nga manuhiri e nga hau e whā. Nau mai, haru mai, whakatau mai rā. Nau mai, haru mai ki te tautoko e te whakawhiti kōrero e te kaupapa mia nui o tēnei wā. Nō rera, nō rera e te whānau. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā nō tātou katoa. You all look so different in real life. I know so many of you from your profiles, from the, the messages that you send me. When I do my lives, I look forward to every time doing them. Why? Because I see the names and the profiles coming up, sending me messages of encouragement, and I feel like I know you. And when I finally meet you, it's like I've already known you already. And it's encouraging for me because this is as great a surprise to me as I'm sure it is to you that I'm standing here at the Logan Campbell Centre talking about this movement that you, the people of Aotearoa New Zealand, have created out of nothing. All of us. I am and remain and will always remain very, very humbled to understand that you are here and you have given me your time to come and support the movement that you have created and putting me at the front of to lead on your behalf. I promise I will always remain humble to the idea that you've put me here, not a billionaire, not an agenda, not a program that was born in the foreign halls of power, but you the people. But truthfully, I am the most reluctant politician you have ever seen. My wife will tell you that. But before we get into it, I want to start with telling you a little bit more about me, about me, who I am as a person, because I think that's really, really super important. Because I always say, and you, you've heard me say it in my presentations, you've heard me say it in my live broadcasts, that if you cannot trust a person that wants to be in the House of Representatives, if you can't trust them, don't put them there. And if you want to put me in there, you need to trust me. Yeah. And we need to do this together. I grew up not far from here. In fact, if you go down that way and keep going that way, you'll come to the Mangere Bridge, and over the bridge, you'll come to a little street called Elmden Street, which, which lies in the shadows of the Maunga of Mangere Mountain there. And I grew up there in a very humble state house with my beautiful mother, and I'd just would like to acknowledge my mum sitting down here, Gailing. And whilst I had a wonderful, happy childhood, I grew up in a very modest home. We had a push-start car. <laughs> and no, I didn't like mum coming to pick us up at school in the push-start car. And especially when that push-start car would stall out the front of Beta Intermediate. <laughs> but I am a, a very loving son of my mum. <coughs> But I'm also a husband, I'm also a father, a grandfather, and I'm an ordinary Kiwi. I've had an amazing, multi-career type of life. I've been a musician most of my adult life since I was a young man. I've toured the world, I've played in halls just like this all over the world. And in fact, the last time I stood on this stage, I was performing with George Thorogood in 1996, 2006. And during this eclectic type of life that I've had, I've earned my scrapes, I've earned my bruises, but 
but I've had a varied and interesting life. I've been an international guitarist, I've been an international business person, I've represented the Māori economy overseas, I've represented North American Indigenous whānau in trade arrangements and discussions around how to do business better. Um, I've been a small businessman, my wife and I, we have a very small uh, ministry that we look after a, a flock of people in Northland. Uh, we have a small ministry where we look after homeless people in Tamaki Makoto. And uh, But we live a very quiet life on our small 23 acre farm in Taitokiro. And a big night for us whānau is Whitaker's Chocolate and Little House on the Prairies. <laughs> no joke. Before, but before being a, a husband, a father, a grandfather, I am a committed Sabbath-keeping Christian. I believe with all my heart that when Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life, he spoke the truth. As many of you will know, I started this journey approximately 11 to 12 weeks ago on a Sunday afternoon on my farm. I was sitting there in lockdown, and after a week of training with my family and working very hard on my farm, I started to look at the narrative surrounding the COVID-19 health crisis. But my journey... An introduction to the COVID-19 health crisis began as I was travelling through the International Airport at Chicago, International Airport at O'Hare Airport in Chicago. And my wife and family and I, as we're going through immigration, it was announced that COVID-19 had entered the world's media system. We had just got there and it was an amazing fright to suddenly come across people wearing face masks and we thought, oh heck, what is this? So we were very fortunate in that I was only there for, for nine days to do some shows, some very important shows with Buddy Guy. And we were there for nine days, and at the end of that nine days, we were very, very pleased to get home to New Zealand, to the safety of our shores of Aotearoa. But as we arrived in New Zealand, we entered a very, very di different atmosphere. When we walked in through immigration, every immigration airport official was wearing a mask. If we turned on and looked at media or TV or radio, all you had was COVID-19. Fear, 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 COVID-19 everywhere, night and day, 24-7, days a week. It was just non-stop. And of course, as many of you know, I come from a research background through my training as a, as a private in the New Zealand Army when I completed the introductory courses to the New Zealand Military Intelligence Corps. And I'd been taught how to evaluate information, research information, and make evaluations from the information that I researched. And what happened for me when I started listening and looking closely at the narrative around the COVID-19 health crisis, I started to see cracks in the story. So what I decided to do, I decided to put my military intelligence training cap back on, and I decided to research the narrative surrounding the COVID-19 health pandemic. And what happened was this. What happened was this, is that I d designed a roadmap which would demonstrate what I call the chain of evidences and information and also the chain of players and actors and the picture that I started to, to uncover told me that the COVID-19 health crisis was something that was going to be used to eventually destroy our democracy here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. When I examined and I listened to the faulty information of Dr Neil Ferguson of the Imperial College UK in London, saying that the lethality of the disease would somewhere be, would be between three and six percent, I knew from study on the research that that meant, that meant an absolutely devastating crisis and impact on humanity, not, not seen since the 1918 Spanish flu of which millions of people died. And I was deeply concerned and worried, and I believed the rhetoric at first. I just want to make, make sure that you understand. I believed the rhetoric surrounding the COVID-19 story, but what I suspected that it was, was that it was a weaponised bioweapon 
that would be used against civilian populations around the world to get rid of a lot of us. <laughs> and what I did, Fano, is that I went right into the heart of the story and I discovered it was based on a science lie. <laughs> And what I discovered soon after that was that there are literally hundreds of scientists and doctors around the world that were standing up to say that there was no basis for which the alarm could be justified that was emanating out of the Imperial College of London and also from the WHO eventually and also from Dr Anthony Fauci in the United States and of course Dr Bill Gates. Oh sorry, he's not a doctor is he? <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry about that. But what we did discover, and what I did discover, is that Dr Neil Ferguson had to stand up and say he had it wrong. It wasn't 3 to 6% lethal after all. Because when he first announced this, he said that if the world did not unify in one global unit to defeat and confront COVID-19, there would be tens of millions of deaths around the world. A week later, he said if we did not practice social distancing and lockdown, there would be tens if not hundreds of millions of deaths around the world. Has there been such a result? No, no there hasn't. But what he had to do, he had to backpedal a, a couple of weeks later to say that his modelling was wrong. But what happened after that? Dr Anthony Fauci, the civilian lead player in, in President Trump's medical team dealing with the health response in the United States, he stood up and said, no, 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 this is the worst thing that the planet has seen. If we don't lock the United States down, it's going to be the worst thing that's ever happened to us. And he said, you've got to listen to us. The world's got to lock down. Let's just put Dr Tony over here a second. Then enters Bill Gates and he says, look, world, I'm going to do you a great favour. My company or in my companies and research labs, we will develop a vaccine and we will ensure every man, woman and child on God's earth will be vaccinated like hell. <laughs> He forgot to mention that he was in a, a United States TV interview the, a year or so before where he was asked by a very wily journalist, Mr Gates, why do you invest so heavily in the vaccine industry? Every now and then, these guys, as smart as they think they are, they put their foot in it. And he came out and said, wow, it's funny you should ask that because for every $1 I invest in the vaccine industry, I get a $20 return. <laughs> he said it. He said it. So let's park Mr Gates over here a second. Back enters into the room, Dr Anthony Fauci, and he says, yes, we've got to do what Bill Gates says. He's a great man, but he forgets to mention that not only is the, he is the director of the National Institute of Health in the United States, but he's a board member on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> And he justifies the lethality of the disease and then enters the WHO, who were, if you remember, were very reluctant to say this, that this was an epidemic. But what happens then? Bill Gates gets on the phone to Tedros, the Director General, and says, by the way, Mr Tedros, my $53 million for my foundation that's going to the WHO is uh, just about to be sent over. I just want to make sure that you're clear and that we are clear we are de dealing with an epidemic. And then he said, of course we're clear. And the next day the WHO declared it was an epidemic and this is documented. This is documented. Everything I say here is documented. It's not conjecture. It's not conspiracy language. So that 53 million US dollars arrived in, into the account of WHO, but which is of course led by who? Tedros. Who is Tedros? He is the Director General, but he is also a former senior henchman in the, in the Atreian People's Liberation Front in Ethiopia, where they led a terrible coup against the government there. And during that coup, or that civil war that was happened there, that happened there, Thousands of people that were resisting this liberation front came down with cholera and he let all of them get sick and he didn't treat them and thousands of them died. This is, in, this is who is in charge of the WHO. But let us not forget that the WHO is a specialist sub-agency of the United Nations. Never forget that. 
So this is Ted Dross. He's a communist. He's a communist. And who did he want to become an ambassador for the WHO? Mr. Robert Mugabe himself. <laughs> One of the greatest genocidal leaders of our time. That would be funny if it wasn't true that Dr. Ashley Bloomfield enters in at this point. And who the heck is Dr. Ashley Bloomfield? He is the unelected Director General of the Ministry of Health in New Zealand. But what else is he? He is a former executive at the World Health Organization doing what? He was in the executive board for who? And for what? The WHO's Infectious Diseases Unit. He, did, he was there between 2010 and 2011. And I can assure you, and I'm sure you know this, that anyone who does any length of time with an organisation like that is going to be fully indoctrinated in the ideology. They are going to be fully indoctrinated. He comes back to New Zealand and, and of course he's now the, the head of our response from the Ministry of Health. Then who enters the scene? Our President Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> Jacinda Ardern. Jacinda Ardern is, the, is a fully groomed globalist. Her history speaks like the perfect book of how to become a Prime Minister that will portray her people and lead us into an undemocratic society. But who is she? She started her political life as a teenager. She had political interests even then. She then went to work for Tony Blair, a really nice man over in the UK. She then comes back to Aotearoa to New Zealand and she begins an internship with you know who? Helen Clark. Who was Helen Clark? She is the matriarch of globalism. I met Helen Clark in New York and I tell you what she's a very, very interesting lady to see up close. I tell you that. <laughs> there was no offer to have dinner or coffee after the meeting. <laughs> but make no mistake, you don't become number three in the United Nations and not be fully indoctrinated into the core of the program. Impossible. She is the matriarch, she is a key influence on our Prime Minister. Our Prime Minister in 2009 becomes the President-elect of the International Youth Socialist Organisation. And a lot of people have said to me, you know, I believe they do some good work. They do some very good work, the International, uh, uh, International Socialist Youth Organisation. And I said, well, that may be, but when you go through the who's who in the zoo that's been the president of this, of this organisation, <laughs> If you look at it, if you look at who's in that list, they're in that list they're either bigwigs in the UN, UNDP, they're bigwigs in government, or in our case they're a Prime Minister. And I would like to put to you today that the people that go through that organisation, they are going through the incubator of globalist communists. And our Jacinda Ardern, she was the president of this very organisation, and her behaviour that she is demonstrating to us today tells us that she is not serving the New Zealand people, but a serving the very people that fund that organisation, which is the United Nations. So the areas of interest, as we heard Tamara talk about earlier, our candidate from Banks Peninsula, and what about a, a thank you to her for introducing uh, Right. One of the concerns that, that, that birthed this movement of ours is our shared concern around a, the United Nations programs Agenda 21 Sustainable Development and Agenda 2030. These are not conspiracies, these are real factual Real programs that if you go to www.un.org, you will see them there. But don't read it as it is there because they use such wonderful language as sustainable, sustainability, social justice, social equity. But what, the, what you can do is scrub all of that out with a big black pen and go control, 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 never ending control. That's what these programs are about.
And our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern stood on a platform similar to this last year in New York at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation event Goalkeepers, where she told the world's media and fellow globalists that she, her government, would lead New Zealand ahead of the rest of the world to fully implement these agendas. Whether we liked it or not, New Zealand, she was going to bring it in and she would be an example of leadership that would take her country into these agendas, these programs that will destroy the very democracy that we understand is a part of Kiwi life. And are we going to let her do that, folks? Thank you. That's right, we're not. But she said she would make an example of New Zealand and bring these agenda in. And I tell you what, she is on script and she is on time right now. And what do I mean by that? Because the COVID-19 health crisis is a mechanism that they're using to bring these agenda in. Now, I'm not saying for one second that the COVID-19 virus doesn't exist. We know it does. We've seen the trail of it. Bill Gates, Tony Fauci have been involved in all of the coronavirus research. We're not going to go there. We know it exists. But it's the consequence of it being there that we need to pay attention because they are going to use this very mechanism to eventually bring in these agenda. And what does that mean to us? It will cause untold misery for all living generations of New Zealanders that understand freedom. Why is that? Because all of us know what it's like to grow our own veggies, grow our own potatoes, our, our pumpkin, our kumara. I was going to say something else here, but you know what I mean. I don't need to say that. <laughs> We know what it's like to go hunting, to gather food, to go fishing, to catch our food. We know what it's like to grow our own food and, and have these joys of the harvest that God gave us. But if she has her way and implements fully these agenda, all this will be destroyed. By why? But why and how so? Because under the agendas 21 and 2030, we will end up in high density urban areas, and that means they're going to re repurpose all their rural and provincial land that we currently live on our farms on, they will repurpose it and they will force us into high density urban living zones which we call super cities and they will repurpose that land that's out there right now and that's why they want to destroy the primary sector, they want to destroy farming and they want to make it impossible to do anything with your land and that's what they're doing right now and I'm speaking to hundreds of farmers across New Zealand and all of them, believe it or not, they know about Agenda 2030, they know about Agenda 21, how and so, because these are the very programs that are going to destroy their income. And we're talking about intergenerational farming families that are going to lose their income. They know this is coming. Yep. So this is Agenda 21 fully, fully implemented. And that's why we're seeing the systematic destruction of the agricultural sector using the green, the green argument, the environmental argument. And the irony of that, Farno, is that most farmers that you meet are completely committed to doing things with the best environmentalism practices, but they cannot partner with the government. The government is hostile towards them, they're, they're aggressive towards them, and they don't help them to partner into using new technologies that will deal with the issues faced with agricultural farming. They know what's coming, so they will force us out of these, out of our provincial and regional homes to live in high-rise technocratic cities. They will want to see us vac force vaccinated. They will want to monitor every aspect of our lives using the 5G technology that will peer into every aspect of your life and radiate you for the privilege. And if they bring this in, Fano, we will become a shadow of the humanity that we are today. So we know that as a family in New Zealand, we have just endured the most disastrous few months and if not a couple of years. Bigger disaster than any tsunami, any tornado, any earthquake. We are enduring right now the communi communistic leadership in a, in a treasonous government under the leadership of Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. They have used this crisis to lock us down 
to get us used to herd control the way they want to control us. We have seen businesses destroyed, lives destroyed, marriages destroyed, suicides because businesses have died. And our economy, ruthless, unrestrained spending with no idea how they're going to pay it all back. No idea. But my friends, I tell you this. The agenda is to get us all in debt to the IMF so we become and collapse business so that we become reliant on the state. The state goes into debt with the IMF and they've got us. And they're repeating this all around the world until the week before last, the president of Belarus stood up and said, no, I will not take 90.4 million to see things your way. released a press release saying that after saying no to 90.4 million they came back and offered him 900 plus million to lock down his country and he said no Belarus is our own state we will not go like Italy we will not follow the plan and what a great man that man is so we all know what's coming I've been speaking about it for weeks now to you all, my whānau. I consider every one of you out there part of my whānau. I truly do. But we are, we are the unwitting victims of a global plan hatched in the foreign halls of power, not born in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but hatched in these foreign halls of power that have no empathy, no sympathy for our lives, for our families, for our futures of our children, and that they wish to control all of us in a centralised unit in the United Nations. We are now have to make a decision, Fano. These two things I want to ask you, right here and right now. Number one, are we going to let the few control the many? <laughs> Are we going to help the rest of New Zealand understand and are we going to come together and fight for our freedoms? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The New Zealand Public Party was a movement born out of the shared concern, the shared feeling of whānau, whanaungatanga as a family, and I am absolutely proud and, and delighted to feel the, the warmth of friendship with our Indian family, our Asian family, South African family, all types of family. Because as I've said from the very first broadcast, if we are going to defeat this, we will do it as a whānau together. Yeah. Yeah. We can do it! <laughs> we can do it! So how will we defeat, defeat this tyranny? Well, as many of, of you know, family, I have been ext extremely committed to this movement. When it first began, I could not believe the tsunami, the avalanche of support of people that have the same concerns as all of us that came in behind me and said, Billy, just keep talking. We will push you out there. Please stand. Go out there. And I fought, fought for weeks not to, not to take this on. I really did. I said to my beautiful wife, I said to her, honey, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to take a stand here. And she said, please don't, honey. Please, please don't do that. Please. And you know what? I said to her, well, just leave it with me. I'm going to pray on it. I'm going to think it through. Because in my life, as you know, my, my life story is out there. I don't have skeletons in my closet. I've got mistakes. And I've made you know everyone aware of those. So they're all out there. There's nothing left for anyone to talk about maybe my $9,000 IRD bill. <laughs> that I've got to pay, but I've been spending all my money on this, so you're going to have to help me with that at some stage, New Zealand. <laughs> But this movement 
was born out of out of very, very humble means. As you know, to become a fully fledged party, you must have 550 registered members. You must submit your registration on a certain day, and if you don't do it, you can't stand. Well, when this party was born on the day that we launched it, we were already too late to, to successfully submit ourselves for registration. But what we did do, we announced that we would take membership. And what happened was this, and believe me, I'm, I'm naive, so when I first understood that you could get 550 members signed up, I thought, oh yeah, that sounds cool. Right? Didn't think too much of it, but normally I'm told it can take weeks, it can take months, it can take a year for you to get your 550 registered members. We did it in two days. <laughs> And I am pleased to announce to you that this party, just slightly more than five weeks old, we average a thousand new members a week since the day that we started. We average one to two hundred new members a day. And it's because of you. And we have had 1.4 million people engagements in the message of the New Zealand Public Party. Your party, your voice, your power. But as you know, when I first started this in my enthusiastic, enthusiastic naivety, I approached all of the minor parties and asked them, look, guys, I've canvassed you all, I know who you are, I've seen how you've performed in the last elections, look what God has given me. He's given me this huge platform of people that want to see this movement grow and to stand in Parliament. Why don't you grab your little platform and we'll come in together and let's all go to Parliament together. Now I was that naive, I just thought, they'd go, yeah, sure, Billy, no problem. <laughs> Indeed, I'm sad to report the opposite has been true. I had people say to me, well, Billy, we can see the massive momentum that you have here. Wow, incredible. But why don't you take your massive base over here and, and, and join us in this little little base over here and we'll, we'll give you a role in about a year's time. And I, you know what I did do? I took it back to the people, some of the people, and they came back and said, you are joking, aren't you, Billy? <laughs> And I said, well, I had to ask the question, and, and you know what, I have spent weeks and weeks and weeks trying to get the minor parties to come on, onto this. But I do understand, and I want to acknowledge the hard work that these minor parties have done on their particular portfolios. They had no idea, thank you, let's acknowledge them, thank you. Thank you. And I understand that it must be extremely frustrating to have planned for your party to go into Parliament for years and years and years, and next minute some Māori from the bush in Northland has a party and streaks over the political sphere and takes over. Very, very humbly. I don't mean to sound like I'm diminishing these minor parties, but the fact is, this this movement that you've created, family, is our greatest chance of getting into Parliament to fix up the zoo down in Wellington. Yeah. Therefore, family, it is my my extremely humble delight to announce to you tonight a couple of very important things. The first one is, yes, we will be standing for the 2020 elections. Thank you. And I would like to formally announce tonight, today, that I will be standing in the Te Tai Tokiro Māori seat electorate. Thank you. I believe in the five years that I have been living in Te Tai Tokiro, I've never seen a more neglected area in our country next to Tairawhiti or Waikato. We 
had such great hope when we had a Māori MP, number two in the Labour Party, one Calvin Davis become number two, we thought he would deliver something to Te Tai Tokiro, and he hasn't done a thing. Not one thing. Not one thing. Right now in Te Tai Tokiro, Māori whānau right now are either living in cars, they're living on the beach, they're living in garages, and they're even, even, and it breaks my heart to say this, they are living in tree houses. Meanwhile, Māori MPs are down in the House of Representatives in Pōrake, getting their wages, getting their salaries, delivering nothing for our people, and I'm going to fix it. It is time that there is backbone in the MPs in the House of Representatives that will serve not only Māori but all people of Aotearoa New Zealand. And it's not just about Calvin Davis because Winston Peters is from up north, he hails from Ngāti Wai and he's done nothing for the people of Te Tai Tukero, and he threw New Zealand under the bus on the way to it. Yeah. We're going to fix this. We're going to make Aotearoa New Zealand great again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. It's about time that we took that catchphrase that took President Trump into the White House, because we're going to say it and get us into Parliament. I would not be standing here today if I was unable to have found a hero that would come to the rescue of the New Zealand Public Party. Only one person out of the entire 19 odd minor parties came to see me and in fact he saw me after I'd launched the party and he said to me, we need to talk. I was ahead my momentum and velocity, that's all good. And then a month later he was in touch with me again. But out of own, all of these people, Fano, and please grasp this with me because it astounds me. Only one person said, hey, Billy, I want to help. You need to stand. I'm going to put myself aside. Please come into this. Please come and I'll work with you. Only one man said, Billy, I want you to use my party as the shell that you can stand for, that you can merge with, and I want you to be take the number one list position in this party. <laughs> Family, he is a leader. He is a hero. He's like me. He's got to scrape some bruises from life. But he is someone that felt so deeply concerned with what's happening in New Zealand that he put himself aside and he has given us the ability to do this. Please welcome to the stage my co-leader and in the Advanced New Zealand Alliance with the New Zealand Public Party, Jamie Lee Ross. Thank you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Good 
afternoon, Logan Campbell Centre. Good afternoon, New Zealand Public Party Fano. And now, good afternoon, Advance New Zealand. What a special day we have today as we set forth and launch our new alliance of parties. The coming together of many different people, many different parts of our nation, climbing on the same waka and paddling in the same direction. Yeah. The right direction. Yeah. I've got to say this would have to be one of the most exciting days of of my political career so far. And, and I've been doing this a while. I've spent 16 years in politics, 10 of those in the parliament, and never before have I been privileged to speak in such of a large crowd, an excited crowd, willing to take on this election. You know, it was only a week ago, only a week ago, that Billy and I were sitting in my office. We were discussing how we could bring our parties together and how we can launch a new alliance to take on the political world. Yesterday, the Green Party held a campaign launch. They had about 200 people turn up. <laughs> Last weekend, New Zealand First held a campaign rally. They had about 250 people turn up. It was a free event, by the way. <laughs> The weekend before that, the ACT Party held an event, and about four or five hundred people turned up. Look around you, ladies and gentlemen. Look around you. Over 1,500 people registered for this event in less than a week. Look how many people are here. This is one of Auckland's largest venues, and look how many people we have here. Look at this crowd. And this, that's what this movement is all about. It's about people power. It's about everyday Kiwis coming together to take back our country and reclaim our rights and freedoms once again. This election, we stand on a precipice, and we're standing at the top of a cliff. After months and months of economic carnage around the world, and law change after law change taking away our rights, after successive governments over decades have eroded our freedoms and given away our nation's sovereignty, we come to this year's election. Is 2020 the election where New Zealand eventually goes over the cliff and hits the bottom never to be recovered again? Or is it time for our country to choose a new direction? Is it time for people to say we've had enough of politics as usual? Is it time for people to stand up for ourselves and say to Wellington, this isn't working for us? Are we just going to pick the same type of politics that we've always had, only to get the same result over and over again? <laughs> Judith, Jacinda, Winston, they're all one and the same. Cut from the same cloth, repeating the same failed policies over and over again. Now I don't know about you, but I've had enough of politics as usual down in Wellington. It's time for something new. It's time for something different. It's time for the public to stand up and have a say. This is our country, and we want to determine our own direction, and we want it to be about our future once again. A few months ago, I was sitting at home during lockdown. I was looking at the political landscape and deciding where to head. I was building support and membership towards a new political party, Advanced New Zealand. But everywhere I went, I kept finding people on Facebook and Twitter who kept messaging me. Have you seen this guy's videos? Have you seen what he's been saying? Far bro, have you checked out what this Billy fella's got to say? Good question. Who is this Billy dude? Who is this guy? 
that looks like he's just come out of the bush up north, sat himself down in front of his phone, old sweatshirt on, baseball cap on, doing Facebook Lives, left, right and centre. Turns out he had a few interesting things to say as well. And so I did what I often do. I found this dude Billy's phone number and I gave him a call. We called up for coffee. Now, if you know Billy, you know that he's quite the talker. If you know me, I'm, I'm pretty used to having my say and I don't keep my mouth shut either. An hour and a half later, I walked away and I thought to myself, oh yeah, nice guy, but who knows if he'll get anywhere. Well, here we are. Here we are, two months later. Two months later and this dude, Billy, he's pulling crowds better than any new politician I've ever seen. And now we're here today filling the Logan Campbell Centre and launching one of the most exciting new ventures in New Zealand politics for a very long time. Now, we might make light of the early days and the beginnings of this movement, but there's a very serious point to note about why so many people have been drawn to the messages that Billy's been pushing. Hundreds upon hundreds of people are turning up in small towns and communities across the country because there are so many questions to be answered. How did a virus originating in China be allowed to be exported overseas, hit our country, and the government lead us to the point we were giving up our freedom of movement, our freedom of speech, our freedom to refuse medical procedures, and our freedom to live our daily lives. Why aren't we questioning more why the Chinese Communist Party has been allowed to get away with this economic destruction around the world? And why has our parliament passed so many laws that give enormous powers to unelected bureaucrats to tell us to do anything if it's stopping the virus being exported from China. Mandatory isolation, mandatory testing, mandatory vaccinations, warrantless powers of entry into your own home and our military being deployed to carry out public health functions. How did this ever happen here in New Zealand? In our own backyard? And that's why we're here today, ladies and gentlemen. September 19 of the 2020 election... September 19 of the 2020 election is the day we decide as a nation, as a people, to take our country back. And the reason I'm standing here before you today is because taking our country back, it's bigger than one person. It's bigger than one party and it's bigger than one movement. Only by banding together, only by uniting with our brothers and sisters, only by standing up as a united force can we achieve what we need to. Billy and I have come together and we've launched this alliance of parties because we know the task ahead of us is huge. We know that small parties, all trying to do their own thing, is never going to work. It hasn't worked since we've had MMP. Why do any of them think it's going to work now? Today, the merger between the New Zealand Public Party and Advance New Zealand signals the start of an alliance of parties to take back our rights and freedoms yeah. in New Zealand. Yeah. This alliance of parties is very much the modern day centrist version of the alliance party that used to exist. The only time in recent political history when small parties have managed to get a foot in the door is when they've worked together. In the 1990s and the 2000s, a group of people that cared about their country and wanted to make a difference for New Zealand put aside their egos, put aside their differences and formed an agreement to take on the establishment parties together. And 
that, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what we're doing here today. In the last few weeks, Billy and I, sometimes together, sometimes separately, have had meetings and discussions with around seven different small political parties. Some are coming on board and some are still considering it. But the bottom line is, this isn't my waka. This isn't Billy's waka. This is your waka. This is your waka. As the brave warriors used to set forth on a journey, seated shoulder to shoulder, wakahoe or paddles in hand, taiaha at the ready, they knew they could only achieve their goals if they worked together, brothers in arms. And the same goes for us all here in New Zealand politics. If we ever want to take on the establishment parties, if we're ever going to change the direction New Zealand's headed in, then we must unite together. And so I say to the other small parties, it doesn't matter what's been said or done in the past, you're all welcome here. Our alliance of parties... Alliance of parties standing under the Advanced New Zealand umbrella. We'll see, adva so we'll see parties keep their own name, keep their own identity, and keep their own logo. New Zealand Public Party isn't going anywhere, but New Zealand Public Party will be stronger by joining with others. And Billy will still be the leader of the New Zealand Public Party, and NZPP will be on the ballot paper in the electorate that he stands in. I say to Alan and Sue from the Outdoors Party, you're still welcome here. I say to Leighton and Elliot from New Conservatives, you're still welcome here. I say to Jeff and Shai from Top, we have many common goals and shared desires. We should be talking more. And Chris and Amanda from Social Credit, your knowledge and political history is of huge value and we respect you greatly. One party, Heartland Party, New Zealand People's Party, we have to keep talking because this is about New Zealand's future and the direction of our country. This alliance of parties is so crucial to this election because we know that with Labour and National, nothing ever changes. Jacinda might be nice, Judith might be tough, but when you boil it down, whether you have a government with blue stripes or red stripes, it's all pretty much one and the same. Nothing ever changes. The same people are homeless. The same people are jobless. Except unemployment's going up and through the roof. Homelessness is going up as well. The same people in small towns and communities around New Zealand are stuck on welfare because hope and opportunity never visits them. For the last few weeks in Wellington, politicians have been talking more about themselves than anything they want to do for New Zealand. And the election's only two months away. National says they're a strong team, but they're more divided than ever before. They say they'll deliver a stronger economy, but no one's ever come up with a policy for it yet. Labour says they're focused on the economy too. But the best they could come up with for an economic booster was a cycleway across the Auckland Harbour Bridge. They also say they're not going to announce election policies just now because they're too busy. They don't want to engage with the election. But despite all the current faults, the number one problem with the establishment parties is none of them are willing to stand up for the biggest threat to the future of our economy and for our country. Protecting our freedoms, protecting our sovereignty, protecting our democracy. many of you know, I used to be a National MP. I've seen up close the way that party is a cult of leadership. I've also seen the way, more and more, that party has given away our country to foreign interests. Yeah. Labour's no better, by the way. Yeah. 
Ali's already talked about the concerns we have when it comes to the UN and why we must always stand up for the right to make decisions about our own country, protecting our sovereignty. The same goes for the way our country has for far too long aligned ourselves so closely with the interests of the Chinese Communist Party, and that has cost us dearly. Our reputation amongst our traditional trading partners is at rock bottom. We never stand up for ourselves when it comes to questioning the actions and human rights abuses of China. And for too long, our political parties have become addicted to Chinese money in a way that has corrupted our political system. As many of you know, I ultimately left the National Party after blowing the whistle on election donations to the party. I stood up and told the country what had been going on. You've all heard the tapes. You can make up your own mind about what the National Party leader knew and what he got up to. But whether you choose to believe me or believe him, it doesn't matter. Because what is true, without a shadow of doubt, is that foreign money, directly linked to the Chinese Communist Party, has been entering our country in eye-watering sums of money. And just about every MP down in Wellington wants to turn a blind eye to it. Earlier this year I stood up in the Parliament and I outlined clearly the problems we face. A fair and accurate report of the proceedings of Parliament on that day will show that in my speech I described the link that's been made backwards through bank accounts linking donations to the National Party with money flowing from individuals close linked to the Chinese Communist Party. I even tried to table documents to show what I was saying. But guess what? The National Party blocked me from doing it. In recent months I've had leaked to me a full set of financial records from the National Party from the 2017 election. They show every single donor, line by line, dollar by dollar, in raw format. And I can tell you, once again, it's clear that National has been receiving considerable sums of money linked to offshore interests. And that's why they don't have New Zealand's interests at heart. They may have just recently removed from their party list the Chinese spy trainer that's been covertly sitting in Parliament for about a decade, refusing to ever talk to English-speaking media. But the National Party is still bought and sold by Chinese Communist Party linked money. And that's why they can't be trusted to stand up for New Zealand's interests anymore. In the last two weeks of Parliament, before the election, I will once again attempt to table this new set of information that's been leaked to me. It's in the public interest that Parliament sees exactly what's been going on. I suspect National will once again try and block me from doing it, but when they do, you'll know exactly why they don't want that information to come out in public. Our country has lost its way when it comes to our international relationships. We no longer are the proud nation of the Pacific that stands up for itself. And the most serious issue to emerge off the back of the coronavirus pandemic is how our country deals with China. No one seems willing to address this. Like it or not, the world ended up in this position and in this mess because the Chinese Communist Party dealt with coronavirus like a political problem. They threw Western journalists out of the country and they ramped up their propaganda machine. And they hid the real problems away so the world could never see. Unfortunately for New Zealand, we've become so dependent on Chinese Communist Party linked money that no political leader will ever stand up to China. The once courageous political leader